Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Margaret Mayman. I'm Minister in Placement here at Pitt Street Uniting Church. As we offer you a warm welcome, we do so remembering that the land on which we meet was, is, and always will be Aboriginal land. I acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, who are the traditional custodians of the land in this place. And I also pay respects to Gadigal elders, past and present, and extend that respect to any other Aboriginal people who are with us this evening. Welcome to the inaugural annual Pitt Street Lecture in Progressive Christianity, to be presented by our guest speaker, the Reverend Dr. Robin Myers. We are delighted that you have all joined us for this significant event. Our event tonight is part of Common Dreams on the Road, and we're excited that you are getting to know about Common Dreams on the Road if you're not aware of Common Dreams before. The Common Dreams network of religious progressives in New Zealand and Australia has been gathering people together now um, since 2007 when the first Common Dreams conference was held here at Pitt Street Uniting Church. Since then, there have been major conferences in Melbourne and Canberra, and this year in September, there will be the fourth um, Common Dreams conference in Brisbane. But to keep us nourished and um, energised in between those triennial conferences, we have Common Dreams on the road, and we've had some very wonderful speakers join us um, over the time. I shouldn't say that because I was once one of those people, but we've had some really pretty good speakers. <laughs> um, got me this gig, I think. <laughs> The church here um, is, is committed to being a progressive church. It has a strong tradition of theological open-mindedness and advocacy for social justice, which places us in the contemporary movement of the spirit that is called progressive Christianity. This church has been engaging with public issues for a much longer time. During the apartheid era, South African Archbishop Desmond Tutu addressed a packed church when no Sydney church of his own denomination would host him. So Pitt Street was that place. Members of Pitt Street have been involved in seeking justice for LGBTI people since the 1980s. In the 1990s, some, the minister and Dorothy McRae McMahon and some of the members were subject to vicious harassment by members of Australia's extreme right because of their anti-racism actions. And in February this year, Pitt Street was one of the first 10 churches to offer sanctuary to the 267 people fleeing persecution, first from their own countries and now from the Australian government, which plans to remove them to offshore detention on Nauru. We passionately support the end of offshore detention and the Let Them Stay campaign. So tonight, as I said, is our inaugural annual lecture in Progressive Christianity. Progressive Christianity is characterised by a willingness to question tradition, by a celebration of human diversity, a strong emphasis on social justice, care for the poor and the oppressed, and environmental justice for planet Earth, our only home. Progressive Christianity draws on the insights of multiple theological streams, including liberalism, postmodernism, and liberation theology. But it's not simply a project of deconstruction, it's an imaginative and creative re-expression of our inherited tradition in ways that resource us to live well, open to the sacred, and to loving one another. It involves our heads, our hearts, and our hands. It's theological, it's spiritual, it's justice-seeking, and it's compassionate. So tonight we are delighted to welcome to Pitt Street the Reverend Dr. Robin Myers. Dr. Myers is a perfect choice as our inaugural lecturer because he brings together academic and congregational experience in his creative and inspiring work. He is both a scholar and a working pastor. Robin is an ordained minister in the United Church of Christ, distinguished professor of social justice at Oklahoma City University, best-selling author of seven books, a widely traveled lecturer and preacher on behalf of progressive Christianity, and an award-winning columnist for the Oklahoma Gazette and National Public Radio. And you can hear his interview that he did today um, with John Cleary on ABC, National, uh, on ABC 702 on Sunday night. Robin has been the senior minister 
of Mayflower Congregational, Church, Congregational UCC Church of Oklahoma City since 1985. We don't let our ministers stay that long in one place here, Robin, but <laughs> I think that's a, it's a wonderful way of developing a really strong ministry and a good connection. It's the fastest growing UCC church in the Kansas and Oklahoma Conference. Robin was born in Oklahoma City and grew up in Wichita, Kansas. After graduating from Wichita State University, he received his MDiv from the Graduate Seminary of Phillips University, his Doctorate of Ministry from Drew University, and his PhD from the Communication Department of the University of Oklahoma. His dissertation was on the merits of self-persuasion in preaching and was published as a textbook for preachers. It's one I think we should check, some of us should check out. Self-persuasion <laughs> sounds like a good way to go. Robin is the author of seven books, most recently, Saving Jesus from the Church, How to Stop Worshipping Christ and Start Following Jesus, The Underground Church, Reclaiming the Subversive Way of Jesus, and Spiritual Defiance, Building a Beloved Community of Resistance. He is a fellow of the Jesus Seminar, a member of the Board of Directors at the West Star Institute, and a new member of the God Seminar. Robin is married to Sean Myers, an Oklahoma artist and university professor. Sean, I see you over there. We are delighted that you are also with us at Pitt Street for this visit. So now I invite all of you to join me in warmly welcoming Robin Myers as we engage in the challenge of saving Jesus from the church. Good evening. First of all, thank you so much for having us. We are a long way from home. We're from Oklahoma. That is, we have never been to Sydney before, never been to Australia before. I don't know how often you go in search of lecturers in progressive Christianity from Oklahoma, but here we are. And I want to talk a little bit about how strange a place that is, Oklahoma. The name itself means red man. And politically and theologically, it is the reddest of the red states in America. It is dominated by the Republican Party and by the Southern Baptist Church. But it's also a place I've served the same congregation for 30 years, a church that advertises itself on our website as, quote, unapologetically Christian and unapologetically liberal. So, perhaps what they say is true, all things really are possible for those who love the Lord. <laughs> so let me begin by saying what I think is the number one cause for the decline of the church in our time. It is, in my opinion, the timidity of clergy. Now, I'm, I'm going to exempt Margaret from all comments related to clergy, but generally speaking, clergy are killing the church by our lack of courage and intellectual honesty. We are busy rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. While people connect online and in coffee shops, church just doesn't seem relevant to them, much less dangerous. Nine churches on average close their doors every day in the United States. So we live in a postmodern, post-denominational, post-creedal, and even for many, a post-Christian world. Now for some this is tragic, for me it is rather exciting because I would like to be part of what's coming next. Besides, we really have lost our way, and I use the word way advisedly. Once the followers of the way were hunted down and killed. Now often we do the killing in the name of Jesus. I am waiting for the first U.S. drone to be named the Corpus Christi. Turn the other cheek has been traded in for preemptive war, and the gospel is now in many quarters a get-rich strategy. Once the Jesus people created an underground anti-imperial movement that, although tiny, constituted an unacceptable threat to the Roman Empire. That is, until by the fourth century, Constantine had arranged a little marriage between the Bride of Christ and Caesar. And ever since, we have been the defenders of the status quo, 
now on behalf of the Pax Americana. How on earth, I wonder, did followers of Jesus who counseled us to pray for our enemies, love the stranger, protect orphans and widows, how did they become the voting base for a major political party in America that can be depended upon to pray for the death of our enemies, to exploit our fear and mistrust of the stranger, to cut programs that help orphans and widows, and to make life miserable for gays and lesbians. Mark Twain was right when he said that if Christ were to return today, one thing he would certainly not be is a Christian. One of my frustrations with the church these days is that I hear so, so little preaching that has anything to do with what's actually going on in the world. We seem to have lost our prophetic voice completely. A few years ago, when scientists determined with irrefutable evidence that the level of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere had passed the dreaded 400 parts per million, the so-called tipping point for global climate change, that article appeared on the front page of the New York Times. On the day the story broke, and this is arguably the most important story for the future of the human race, not a single national or local news program reported on it. They didn't even mention it. Perhaps because news divisions are now part of the entertainment divisions of major corporations, and what dominates our newscast these days involves celebrities and athletes, often one and the same, and what they tweeted recently. One of these days, our grandkids, and I have two, are going to be asking us what in the world we were doing while the planet was heating up. The answer to quote the marvelous book by the same title by Neil Postman, we were amusing ourselves to death. The church should be the one institution in society that can be depended upon to say what needs to be said anytime, all the time marching to the beat of a different drummer, the Jesus drummer, if you will. So when people ask me if I'm hopeful about the future of the church, I say, well, I'm not optimistic, but I am hopeful. That's because in the church, we know the difference between hope and optimism. Optimism is often just a thinly disguised form of selfishness, a marketing strategy, a pep talk, what Ken Wilber called the ego in drag. While hope, hope, as Emily Dickinson put it, hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. Years ago when I was in seminary, the late William Sloan Coffin Jr. came to my seminary in Little Enid, Oklahoma and shocked all of us when he said he believed America might very well go fascist. He said it would happen in the next 30 years, and that was 30 years ago. Fascist, we were shocked, surely not. That is such an ugly word, but Coffin wasn't talking about Nazis. Rather, he was talking about the broader definition of fascism, which can take many forms, but whose essence is this, control of the government by special interests with the blessing of the church. Yikes. He was talking about the cross wrapped in the flag and ruled by multinational corporations that control the political process and manipulate the minds of consumers with petty nonsense so we don't think about the fact that our democracy is really becoming a plutocracy or more accurate, perhaps, a corporateocracy. It was George Orwell, after all, in his classic book, 1984, the most prophetic book ever written, who portrayed thought control as being accomplished in part by having screens everywhere. He called them telescreens, and they pumped propaganda into us disguised as news. Fair and balanced, of course. Yikes. So my question is, where were the preachers in my country 
when the Supreme Court ruled in the Citizens United case, which may turn out to be the worst high court ruling since Dred Scott, that corporations are people, people, who can form super PACs and give unlimited amounts of money to campaigns and keep the identity of their givers a secret. What good is a pulpit, after all, if you can't be free to say, hey, would any of us recognize a corporation if we met one walking down the street? How absurd. Isn't this exactly what you would do if you wanted to destroy a democracy from within? This year, as we pick a new president, two billionaire brothers from my hometown of Wichita, Kansas, Charles and David Koch, K-O-C-H, will spend more money, just the two of them, to see their candidates win than will be spent by the entire National Republican Party. Now nothing is what it appears to be, and facts do not matter. In fact, we're living in a fact-free political environment in the United States. Recently, a U.S. Senator lied about Planned Parenthood in a speech on the floor of the House, claiming 90% of what Planned Parenthood does is abortion. In fact, it's only 3%, a rather sizable mistake. His office apologized the next morning with perhaps the most frightening explanation I've heard from an elected official's staff. Quote, the senator was not intending to speak factually on the matter. Well, of course not. He's just a senator. You know, we often criticize our ancient ancestors for living their lives under a cloud of superstition and myth, but we're no different. We live by our own myths. We say things in America like this. The Tea Party is a grassroots movement. Supply-side economics is good for the middle class. Asking the rich to pay their fair share of taxes is class warfare. Women can't be trusted anymore to make decisions about their own bodies. Politics in America has become one more form of entertainment in a celebrity culture. Why else would anyone care what Donald Trump has to say? Donald Trump, we're just as scared as you are. He is the presumptive nominee of the Republican Party of the United States for the most important and dangerous job in the world. And he is the most unqualified and mentally unstable person ever to run for the highest office in the world. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free said Jesus. Well, perhaps the opposite is also true. You shall know how to lie, and those lies will imprison us all. As the gap between rich and poor has now reached its highest level in American history, one in six Americans lives below the poverty line, one in four children can't be certain where their next meal's coming from, what do we hear? What do we hear from the Church of Jesus Christ? the Prince of Peace, the man of boundless compassion for the weak and the dispossessed. Mostly we hear arguments over abortion and gay marriage. In the run-up to our disastrous war in Iraq, with of course the help of Tony Blair, how many sermons were preached around here calling for us to step back and consider the moral justification for a preemptive war based on non-existent weapons of mass destruction. Where were the preachers in America when we dismantled our most cherished judicial beliefs at Guantanamo Bay? Did they fear sounding weak on terrorism, even though we all claim to worship a God whose power is made perfect in what? In weakness. Where were preachers when all Americans were being spied on by our own government? Or when a discussion was taking place at the highest level about whether or not we should torture our prisoners or just send them to other countries to be tortured? When was the last time that a church was a thorn in the flesh of the empire, whether in America or in Australia? The answer is we are now part of the empire. And we have become, in the words of Harvey Cox, 
its compliant acolyte. We bless soldiers and we curse conscientious objectors as if it is the job of the beloved community to serve as a kind of military chaplain to the empire. When, for example, was the last time you heard a sermon in which a preacher lamented the fact that in America we love sports more than we love children? That's very easy to prove, by the way. And how do we know that's true? Because the United States has the best sports stadiums in the world and the worst public schools in the world. Jesus, the Prince of Peace, it doesn't seem to be getting through. 86% of Americans claim to be Christians, but we're the most violent society in the developed world. Our games are violent, our movies are violent, our political process is violent, our homes are violent, especially for women. And we worship the warrior as if our cause is always just, and we know what's best for the rest of the world. So if a pastor believes this, and then private pastors tell me they do all the time, it ought to be in the sermon. What good is it to send someone to seminary if you refuse to hear what they learned when they graduate? Important things like how we really got the Bible, about all those other so-called Gnostic Gospels that got left out and declared heretical, about the astonishing fact that there are more discrepancies in the copies of copies of copies of New Testament manuscripts than there are words in the New Testament. That apostles named Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are not likely to be the actual names of those who wrote them, but were almost certainly Greek-speaking elites who lived decades later and borrowed, some would say forged, those apostolic names in order to have their work taken seriously. That Jesus, Paul, Matthew, and John all represent very different approaches to faith. Or that, the most, or that most of the doctrines we say define Christianity, the divinity of Jesus, the Trinity, the blood atonement, are all inventions of still later theologians. Should people know this? Of course they should. Can they handle it? Because my friends say, my people can't handle this. Of course they can. They are adults. If some of them end up leaving the church in a huff, it might be the best thing that could happen to those who are left behind. And may I say this to the women, the women present, how long are you going to be silent when the world, encouraged by a patriarchal church and patriarchal values, continues to treat you as second-class citizens who can't make choices for yourselves? Do you know where the church would be without women? It wouldn't be. It would not exist. According to the gospel story, women were last at the cross and first at the tomb, and no church that I know of could possibly survive without the women. So here's the problem. In a world now completely run by corporations, we are running out of independent voices. If not the church, then what other institution in our society is going to get up and say, in the spirit of the emperor's new clothes, the emperor is naked? The naked truth is that many Americans have resurrected the philosophy of Ayn Rand, where everyone is on his or her own, and the so-called producers shall never be burdened by the so-called moochers. So what I want to know is what happened to the common good. The common good is what Jonathan Winthrop meant by a city on a hill. Ronald Reagan took that famous phrase out of Winthrop's sermon, took it out of context, and added the word shining, as in America is a shining city on a hill, and made it sound as if Winthrop was saying that the whole world would look up to America and be envious of us, a shining city on a hill, and want to move here. But what Winthrop was saying was that everyone was watching us, and that if we failed to be our sister and brother's keeper, we would fail the whole world. Slightly different message. As for the early church, the first Jesus people, 
those supposedly orthodox, well-behaved, salt-of-the-earth pilgrims, well, they were apparently doing things that we would find truly frightening. For one thing, it's obvious that the word socialism had not been invented yet as an all-purpose epithet. Listen to Acts 4. This is in the Bible. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions. But everything they owned was held in common. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. That sounds positively Marxist to me. I mean, everything was owned in common and there was not a needy person among them and they redistributed wealth. So why has the word liberal, which is the essence of America's amazing experiment in democracy, why is that a dirty word? Liberal, the L word we call it in Oklahoma. The L word has become a religious and political obscenity. But if you look it up in the dictionary, it just means open-minded, tolerant of divergent opinions, and exceedingly generous. So I would hope all of us could be more liberal. A next-door neighbor of ours, an elderly woman, was talking to my wife, Sean, the other day, and she asked her quite earnestly if it was true what she had heard that I was a liberal. Is it true, she said, that your husband is, is a, and it's very hard for Oklahomans to say the word, is a l l liberal? And when Sean responded, yes, it, it, it's true, the woman just shook her head and she said, but he seems like such a nice man to me. <laughs> so in Oklahoma, one is either a Christian or one is a Democrat, but one cannot be both at the same time. That would be peculiar. We love football, country western stars, and anyone in a uniform. We live in the land of big hair and what Ernest Hemingway called broad lawns and narrow minds. We have more pickup trucks than people. You guys don't have pickup trucks here. And lots of Hummers, at least one of which I saw sporting a bumper sticker after the invasion of Baghdad that read, powered by Iraqi blood. And here's the irony of ironies. In Oklahoma, we all agree on one thing. We love Jesus. I mean, we really, really, really love Jesus. And the evidence is everywhere. It's on bumper stickers. It's on billboards. It's on downtown skyscrapers that leave on certain office lights at night in a pattern to form giant illuminated crosses that mark our city, I guess, as a Christian city, just in case there's any non-believers driving by on the interstate who might need to be reminded that they're going to hell. Jesus is the reason for the season. Put Christ back in Christmas, got Jesus and all that. See, where I come from, Jesus is kind of like a rock star or, or a brand of running shoe. In fact, it finally occurred to me what we've really done is turn Jesus into a form of neutral energy, sort of like a gasoline additive, like STP. You know, you just put that in your tank and it helps you get wherever you're going faster and with fewer knocks. But no one asks, where are you going? Sometimes in the church, I wonder if we've confused courtship with discipleship, being a fan of Jesus with being a follower of Jesus. Because I'm telling you tonight, the best kept secret in the Southern United States is the inverse relationship between regional religiosity and bad social statistics. This is what I mean. Uh, you've guessed it because you went, hmm. In Oklahoma, we have more churches per capita, just about anyone, and also among the highest rates of teen pregnancy, divorce, domestic violence, substance abuse, and abject poverty in the country. It's almost as if the more unrealistic is the approach to religion, and this is what, why progressive Christianity is so important. It's almost as if the more unrealistic is the approach to religion, the more it resembles a fairy tale, 
the sooner comes the stroke of midnight. Or treat people like children and they act like children. Take weddings, for example. Over the years, I've come to see a sort of direct correlation between the big blowout wedding ceremony complete with bridezilla who, who makes everyone miserable in order to have the perfect wedding she read about in some bridal magazine and how long that marriage is likely to last. It's like the church these days, all show, no go. Now I know what you're thinking, it sounds like I really don't like living in Oklahoma, so why don't I just move? Maybe to Sydney. Beautiful. But to be honest, I've met some amazing and wonderful people in Oklahoma. On the high plains where you can see the horizon, we have a kind of hybrid vitality shaped by adversity. It is, after all, the land of Will Rogers, Carl Albert, Jim Thorpe, and Angie DeBeau, and a civil rights activist named uh, uh, Clara Looper organized the very first lunch counter sit-ins in Oklahoma City at the dawn of the civil rights movement, at Katz Drugstore. We are the Okies immortalized by John Steinbeck in the Grapes of Wrath, survivors of the Dust Bowl, the worst of hard times. And in Oklahoma, they're some of the hardest working, most generous people who ever walked the face of the earth. And besides, for a liberal preacher, let's face it, Oklahoma is the mission field. <laughs> uh, I mean, why, why go to a third world country to talk about Jesus when you can talk about him in a place where everybody already loves him, but would have him arrested immediately upon his return? Over a decade ago, a New Testament professor from my alma mater, Phillips Theological Seminary, invited me to join that remarkable and controversial group of historical Jesus scholars that goes by the name the Jesus Seminar. And that has been an enormous blessing to me. It's why I'm here tonight. Not only because it's just fun to hang out with John Dominic Crossan and the late Marcus Borg and Brandon Scott and Jack Spong and Karen Armstrong and Elaine Pagels in small groups, mind you, just to mention a few, but because it is so stimulating to hear scholarship in pursuit of the truth, just the truth, not in pursuit of any sectarian or ecclesiastical agenda. Now, sadly, there are not many pastors that are invited to be fellows of the West Star Institute, so we have this divide. Scholars do their work in their ivory towers, pastors do their work in their parishes, and never do the two seem to get together in the same room. Yet pastors need the work of scholars, and scholars need the real-world experience of pastors. Because all of us are in pursuit of the same thing, the truth in service to a perishing world. Now, of course, this can make you into a heretic. But that word, heretic, only means to choose. And I choose to believe that given what scholars have helped me to understand, the leaders of the church turned a Galilean sage into a supernatural savior and have now largely replaced faith in the radical practice of unconditional love with intellectual assent to theological propositions which Jesus never uttered and which often conflict with or even reverse the teachings of his earthly ministry. Now we're living through this moment that's rightly been called a new reformation. The church finds itself holding what the late Phyllis Tickle compared to a giant rummage sale. I love this metaphor. It's as if church people are just going through all their old stuff in the attic, asking difficult questions. What do we keep? What do we throw away? And millions have decided the church would rather die than throw anything away, so they have walked away, joining what Bishop Spong calls the largest demographic group in America, the Church Alumni Association. Let me give you one example of how cutting edge biblical scholarship could impact the church if it were just shared in a positive way, really, if pastors would tell the truth. Many of the things that students were taught in seminary about the early church until very recently were defective 
in at least three important respects. First, I was taught that there was something amorphously called early Christianity, and that the closer one gets to the beginning, the more orthodox everyone was. And it was only later I was told that heretics infiltrated the church and led it astray. Second, I was taught that the concept of apostolic authority took shape right away, as did the creeds and hierarchies that were necessary to combat these assaults from heretics. Third, I was taught in seminary that although the Roman Empire formed the political and cultural locale in which early Christians lived, it was mainly just the background, and except for the persecutions and the martyrs, had little to do with how early Christian leaders shaped their own ideas and actions. All three of these assumptions have now proven to be erroneous. In fact, they are dangerous myths. First, there never was a single early Christianity. People argued over the nature of the divinity of Jesus from day one. They argued over what happens to us when we die. They argued over whether to accept Gentiles and pollute the Jewish gene pool. And what about circumcision? And what about eating meat that's been offered to idols? And what about the role of women? And what will happen to the Jews who don't accept Jesus? They argued all the time, and yet, the idea of orthodoxy and heresy, as we understand those words today, did not exist. Second, it was not the apostles themselves who invented the idea of apostolic authority, but rather subsequent generations of ambitious church fathers. And they invented it to secure their own positions of authority and power in the church. Both the creeds and the all-male hierarchies emerged much later in the church than had been previously thought. And last but not least is myth number three. An essential key to comprehending the earliest Christians, including those who wrote the New Testament, is to see their movement as a self-conscious alternative to the empire that tyrannized them. These Jesus people, they were anti-imperial, and they paid for this resistance with their lives. They were so dangerous, in fact, such a thorn in the flesh of the empire, that they had to meet in secret for decades as an underground movement, scratching the sign of the fish on a doorpost to mark the latest location of their secret meetings. Because it used to be dangerous to be a Christian, now it's just boring. Thank you there on the back row. According to 1 Corinthians 15, go back and read 1 Corinthians 15, Paul did not believe in a physical resurrection, even though he wrote the earliest material in the New Testament. The supernatural accounts of the birth of Jesus were not added until either the 8th or 9th decade of the first century, and as for the virgin birth, Paul only refers to Jesus as, quote, born of a woman, which covers most of us. <laughs> and Mark's gospel, the earliest of the four, of course, has no birth stories at all. As to this claim that Jesus was born of a virgin and a son of God, those claims were a dime a dozen in those days. And they were most notably used to describe the Caesar's they were virgin-born sons of God, which is exactly what made the claim of the church so audacious. They made it about a penniless rabbi from Nazareth. They stole the honors given to Caesar and gave them to a nobody from a backwater town out of which nothing good could come. So while we are still arguing over the biological implausibility of the virgin birth, we miss the deeper point that this is how a first century Jew would describe someone who seemed remarkable, born of the spirit, not of the flesh. And to say that Jesus was born of a virgin and the son of God was to make it clear that you were loyal to a very different ruler and you were going to exercise a very different kind of power and have a different vision of the future. And Rome was not amused. 
I've always wondered what it would be like just to travel back in time and drop into one of those first and second century gatherings of the Jesus people, the way. Scholars tell us what we would discover is that there was in fact no standardized theology, no single pattern of governance, no uniform theology, and no commonly accepted scripture. So the obvious question, what held them together? Well, apparently, the only thing that united these otherwise disparate underground gatherings was their profession of loyalty to the way of Jesus. When they said, Jesus Christ is Lord, they were talking about the Jesus ethic, if you will, which was the upside-down world of the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes, this new order which he'd established by his life, death, and resurrection. Jesus Christ is Lord. That's all they said. And that wasn't a creed or a doctrine. It just meant quite simply, we believe Jesus is Lord and Caesar is not. And that was a very dangerous thing to say. These Jesus people were a joyful but hardly homogeneic, homogeneous group. Some emphasize the historical Jesus, others the universal Christ, others a mystical inner Christ, but there were no clergy as we know them today, and as for worship, it was a common meal to which the poor were invited, prayer and singing and reading whatever they could get their hands on, if anyone in the group could read. All were baptized, though by different methods, after a long period of training, sometimes lasting up to two years. And get this, after baptism in the early church, one became, for all practical purposes, a pacifist, refusing to wear the uniform of any army. Just think how things have changed. Christianity was not, in the beginning, a belief system but it was instead a peculiar way of being in the world in which the Jesus people embodied love and practiced radical hospitality. For example, here's one of the things I learned by hanging out with those Jesus seminar types. Did you know that in the Sermon on the Mount, the most famous sermon ever preached, there's not a single word in it about what to believe? Not a single word. There's lots of words about what to do and how to be in the world, but not a single word in the Sermon on the Mount about what to believe. Now fast forward to 325 CE and the infamous Council of Nicaea, where Constantine got his quarreling bishops together and demanded they come up with a creed so everyone would know what a Christian believes. And what came out of that council, of course, was the Nicene Creed. And for over 1,700 years, it's been recited by Christians in worship. And guess what? If you read it carefully, you will discover that there is not a single word in the Nicene Creed about what to do or how to be in the world. Only words about what to believe. That's no small change. It's what I call in my work the great reversal. And I think we need to reverse the reversal so we can, if you will, go back to the future. When I ask people, um, when I'm talking to people and they say, well, just give me an example of how you think over time Jesus became more supernatural. You know, Galilean sage to supernatural savior. Explain what you mean by that. How does he get more supernatural and less human? Well, in the first gospel, Mark, he says, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone humble, self-effacing, then by the last gospel, he's reported to have said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one cometh unto the Father but by me. But there's an even more dramatic example. Just consider the difference in the New Testament accounts when it comes to the moment at which Jesus becomes Son of God. For Paul, the earliest writer of what ended up in the New Testament, Jesus becomes the Son of God at the resurrection. God adopts Jesus, Son of God, when he raises him from the dead. That's Paul's theology, adoption theology. Now for Mark, written 15 to 20 years after Paul, when does Jesus become Son of God? It's while standing in the Jordan River, being baptized by John as a grown man. 
Now go a decade or so later when Matthew and then Luke write their gospel and when does Jesus become son of God? At his miraculous conception. Notice we keep going back in time from resurrection to baptism to conception and finally when John writes the last gospel around the turn of the century when does Jesus become son of God? He's always been son of God because he was pre-existent with God. It's like he grew up in God's house. He was there from the beginning of time. Take that, Jews. Jesus goes all the way back. You've got Moses. We've got pre-existent Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and the Word became flesh and lived among us. And we've seen his glory as of a father's only son. So, my, the church has work to do. If we have promoted Jesus into a deity that we can worship but hardly be expected to emulate mere mortals that we are, then we may actually need to demote him by the return of his humanity so that we can again worship the loving God to which he pointed us through the mystery of what we call the Incarnation. Rudolf Bultmann put it well a long time ago. Jesus came preaching God and the church came preaching Jesus. Now we don't have to agree with each other on everything before we can love each other or do common mission work on things we do agree about. We agree about much more in the church than we disagree about. Hungry people need food. The world is too violent, and the planet we live on is perishing. So I have a modest proposal, at least in America, for calling a truce on the incessant and tiresome arguments over these so-called culture war issues. Simple. If you don't believe in abortion, if you don't think it's ever moral under any circumstances, then under no circumstances should you ever have an abortion or counsel anyone to have an abortion. But I just cannot believe we should make that decision for every woman in every circumstance in which she may become pregnant. Likewise, if you oppose gay marriage, that's fine. Just refrain from actually marrying a gay person. Just say no. Just say no. But remember, Marriage is about covenant, it's not about gender. And who are we to tell two people who love each other that they are forbidden to embark upon the difficult but life-giving adventure that is marriage? Who are we? Now let me pause for a warning to all of us who call ourselves progressives. That's who I hang out with a lot, liberals. And we have our own set of hyper-intellectual problems. Indeed, in many a cerebral crowd, there lurks a dangerous illusion, namely that religion is mostly up here in the head, and that if we think a good and clever thought, we have done a good and clever deed. <laughs> For pastors, this is especially uh, tempting because we preach a good sermon series about love. We think we've done something loving. You know, people ask us for copies of the sermon. Must have been wonderful. We don't actually have to love people, do we? One does not, after all, become gracious by reading a good book on grace, but by, by acting graciously. Yea, verily, I have met some liberals in my time who were as snarky and judgmental as the most insufferable fundamentalists. So be warned, we're sinners too. Now, what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? Uh, when people ask me, how do you do that? I mean, I, like, what is Christianity 101? What's, what's the first step? My answer surprises them. They expect me to give them a list of things to believe. I start by saying this. Next time you're in the grocery store and you see the young black man who sacks your groceries, avoiding your gaze, meet it and say, thank you, sir. Or put in a garden and tend it and be reborn to the experience of eating something you planted and then picked with your own hands, something not processed, I can promise you this is very close to a religious experience. 
or raise your children to understand that violence in all its forms is the scourge of humanity and there's nothing, absolutely nothing glorious about war. War is sin. Or practice the lost art of being humble in a world that tells you to think about nobody but yourself. Walk lightly through your day and don't think of yourself as any big deal. You'll be happier. My wife, bless her heart, has taken it as her mission to remind me every single day, Robin, you're no big deal. <laughs> and she should know. Leave places, things, and people better than you found them. Don't litter, don't cheat on your taxes, even if you think you can get away with it. And remember, you're not self-made. Nobody is self-made however appealing that idea may be. And if you want the benefit of, doubt, of the doubt from people, then you should give people the benefit of the doubt. And don't let atheists who write best-selling books bother you. We're going to have to have more honest conversations in church about what in the world we mean when we say the word God. Often when I hear some famous Atheists like Richard Dawkins explain why he doesn't believe in God by describing the God he doesn't believe in I'm tempted to say hmm I don't believe in the God you don't believe in either and what I ask my own congregation to think about on a regular basis is the vital difference in religion between the irrational which is believing, you some, believing something you know is not true and the transrational which is believing in more than can be known because this would help countless people come back to worship who don't want to check their brains at the door Christians have to remember the wisdom of the Tao when you think you know that is when you do not know but when you know that you do not know that is when you know and this much my life has taught me. People need a beloved community now more than ever. We need sacred space where people can actually make promises to care about one another and then try to keep them. Because as amazing as our gadgets are, we live in a time of deep electronically facilitated illusions of social networking. A life spent in front of a computer is a lonesome life. We need to stop hiding behind our emoticons and remember that the very term virtual relationship is an oxymoron. The beloved community requires bodies in the presence of other bodies in order to be the body of Christ. And our preaching, it's got to be biblically responsible, intellectually honest, emotionally satisfying, and socially significant if the church is to survive. The truth is, none of us gets out of this life alive. All families are dysfunctional. And either all of us matter or none of us do. And don't kid yourself, I can get as depressed as the next person, as discouraged. Sometimes I just want to roll over, go back to sleep. Maybe invite all my clever anarchist friends over for a big gripe session, you know, pour everyone a big cup of despair and drink a toast to turning out the lights. Except then I remember why I'm still hopeful. I remember some of the remarkable things we've just lived through in America. The election of the first African American, not once, but twice, to be the 44th president of the United States and his middle name is Hussein. Oh that Dr. King could have lived to see that moment. The Supreme Court that ruling that recently legalized gay marriage in all 50 states. This is one way we're ahead of you Australia. Come on, come on. Capping a change in attitude about our GLBT sisters and brothers that was stunning in its swiftness. And although the media hardly gave this the attention it deserves, the Paris Climate Change Summit brought together a remarkable coalition of nations who've pledged at least to no longer live in denial and who have taken the first steps toward reducing carbon emissions. Years ago, I heard a commercial for something called York Peppermint Patties. I think they still have these. 
And it was their tagline. I don't know if any of you remember what the tagline was for York peppermint patties, but I came to realize it's actually the credo of America. Does anybody know? You can't be too rich or too thin. That's my land, that's where I live. <laughs> land of the free, home of the brave. Actually, that isn't true, of course. Howard Hughes proved you can be too rich. Karen Carpenter proved you can be too thin. And if that's the unofficial credo of our image-obsessed and materialistic society, then I'd like to suggest for the progressive church a very different credo. You can't be too honest or too compassionate. To begin with, we've got to recover our sacred vocabulary and not let the culture steal all our best words. Grace, sacrament, epiphany. These are our words and we'll not give them up without a fight. We will say what we mean and mean what we say. So, for example, when we hear someone say, say, say at the street corner, um, have you heard about so-and-so, the quarterback? He's got a sore arm. He might not be able to start in the big game. It's a crisis. A quarterback with a sore arm is a crisis? No, it's not. It's not a crisis. It's a quarterback with a sore arm. A crisis is a father with four kids and no job. A crisis is a mother whose husband abandoned her and who now shoots up in front of her kids to make it through the day. A crisis is a photograph of the Arctic ice shelf, which is today 40% smaller than it was 30 years ago. That's a crisis. So don't just wrap yourself up in dogma or believe in word magic. So someone out there says, I believe in the literal virgin birth, that's fine. But does it change the shape of your day? Perhaps you're waiting for the second coming. You think the second coming is really, really important. Could that be because deep down you were really disappointed in the first one? Oh, you say, I'm a dyed-in-the-wool Trinitarian. Good, fine. But have you ever wondered if just three doesn't sell God a bit short? Now more than ever, the world needs a church with an open table because a closed communion table is the anti-gospel. The church should make it clear that everyone who's sick should be able to see a doctor and not go bankrupt. The church must lead the way in standing up against all those who would discriminate against or mistreat our gay and lesbian sisters and brothers. They are not freaks of nature. They are our sisters and brothers, nieces and nephews, mothers and fathers, aunts and uncles. They are a constituent of creation. Not long ago, we had a conference in Oklahoma, which is a very homophobic place. We had a conference on, called Homosexuality and the Church, but in Oklahoma, they call it Homosexuality and the Church. And a pastor challenged me in front of the audience for leading a church that was too gay friendly. We know you love the gays, Robin, he said, but read your Bible. God made Adam and Eve. God did not make Adam and Steve. Oh, yeah, okay. I've heard this before. You probably have too. My suggestion, it's cute, but the next time you hear it, you should ask a follow-up question. So who made Steve? <laughs> this has a kind of delayed reaction every time. <laughs> um, to wrap this up and to get to your questions, I want to ask how many of you remember the old Joni Mitchell song, Big Yellow Taxi? Okay, it turned out to be much more prophetic in the 70s than we realized. They paved, they paved paradise and put up a parking lot with a pink hotel, a boutique, and a swinging hot spot. Don't it always seem to go that you don't know what you've got till it's gone? They paved paradise and put up a parking lot. They took all the trees and put them in a tree museum. And they charged the people a dollar and a half just to see them. Don't it always seem to go that you don't know what you've got till it's gone? They 
pave paradise and put up a parking lot. And listen to this. Hey, farmer, farmer, put away the DDT now. Give me spots on my apples, but leave me the birds and the bees, please. Don't it always seem to go that you don't know what you've got till it's gone. They pave paradise and put up a parking lot. I'm afraid in many ways in the church we have paved paradise and put up a parking lot. Divided the house of Jesus into a million pieces because we care more about being right than about being loving. And I think the church of the future will have to make us once more into peculiar and even dangerous people again. Dangerous because we refuse to be conformed to this world, but instead choose not just to transform it by the renewal of our minds, but also by the work of our hearts and our hands. I'm not much interested in the superhuman Jesus because you and I, we're not faster than a speeding bullet. We're not more powerful than a locomotive. We're not able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. We are mere mortals, and God's not going to save us without help from us. To that end, we have the radical teachings and unconditional love of the man from Nazareth, the one the poet Mary Oliver called the man of melancholy madness. I think the time has come and now is when the only thing that can save the church is for it to go underground again. I'm going to talk more about this in the morning. And for all of us to seem a little, a little mad, a little crazy, because crazy is as crazy does. And Jesus, he was a subversive for the cause of love. I think when we baptize people, we should say, do you promise to be crazy like Jesus was crazy? I'm going to start that in my church. I mean, you may be a little crazy for having invited me here. But aren't we all really sick and tired of living life in the shallow end of the pool? So let's push out, shall we, into some deeper water. For if not us, then who? If not here at Pitt Street Church, then where? If not now, then when? As it was written in the Talmud long ago, do not be daunted by the enormity of the world's grief. Do justly now. Love mercy now. Walk humbly now. You are not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to abandon it. To close, I'm going to share the benediction with you we say every Sunday morning in my church back in Oklahoma City at Mayflower. I say, and now may the power of God and the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, which really does pass all our understanding, go with every one of us, abiding in us, lifting us up, making us whole. Go in peace, pray for peace, wage a little peace, and love one another, every single other. Now, the last three words, however, I do not say alone. The whole congregation says every single other in unison. So, those are the last three words we hear in the sanctuary ringing in our ears. And I'd like to ask you to join me in saying them also. So when you hear me say, love one another, you respond with every single other. You ready? And now may the power of God and the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, which really does pass all our understanding, go with every one of us, abiding in us, lifting us up, and making us whole. Go in peace, pray for peace, wage a little peace, and love one another, every single other. You sound so good. Thank you. Amen. <laughs>